And so the people that we, we esteem highly as prodigies or savants, you see them really figure out the vein that they're in and then they just maximize that. Awesome, awesome. It's awesome to be with you guys again. I think this is our third time being with you. And each time it's just great, it's amazing. Um, and you know, I was leaning my heart towards the Lord this week and thinking about what to share. And you know, oftentimes, you know, when it comes to sharing, I know some of you are training for ministry or have been in ministry um, for a number of years. Often what he wants to speak, what he's presently speaking to you is what he wants to speak through you. And at our School of Ministry, School of Revivalist, we have a course called Emotional and Spiritual Intelligence. But lately that's really been on my mind again. It's been on my heart. Just thinking from above. What does thinking from above look like in a life lived in the earth full of the power, love, and wisdom of the Spirit? So what I want to do today is talk to you about spiritual and emotional intelligence. And I'm going to kind of give a framework for it. Now, I know Mama Pat does talk about an anointing quotient and, and stuff like that. Have you guys heard her share on that recently? Yes. And so I'll, I'll pick it back off some of the things that she probably said. But, you know, sometimes if the Lord's highlighting something, and even if you've already heard it, and then a different person comes in and it's being highlighted for them as well, it might be something that's particularly aimed towards, you know, this family of, of, of people who are going through you know, warrior X right now at the same time. And so maybe this is something that he's highlighting. Maybe this is something that will become uh, some of your special sauce, as Papa Leif Hetland says. It's something that we, we not only know about, but this is something that, oh wow, my, my heart, my mind, and my spirit are capturing this. Maybe there's something in this that I can even go deeper in. And if I've been successful as a teacher, then you have questions that I haven't answered and you go on your own discovery and, and you're really interested in this. If I can inspire you to do that, then I know that there's fruit along the way of the vine of your life. So we'll jump right into it. Intelligence, right? We've heard about intelligence our whole life, especially in the Western world. Everything is geared on, well, how smart are you? You know, schools are kind of raised through the intellectual thing. Who's seen the, uh, the little meme and it has like a monkey and a fish? And so what they're doing is they're testing the fish and the monkey both on how well they can climb the tree, All right? And so the monkey passes with flying colors and the fish is like, monk, monk, you know? The fish wasn't put in the environment for where he would thrive. He was put in an environment where he would fail. And so obviously being a, being a father now, I'm thinking a lot about how can I put Emma in the best environment for her to thrive not force her to become something, even something I might project on or desire for her to be. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. Obviously, there can be a continuum from, from parents to kids, and there can be something that the parents are into that the kids are also into. But if you put a fish in a test to climb a tree, it's not going to win. But if you put the monkey in the water, the fish is going to win. So it's understanding the right environment that we can thrive in. Sometimes we're in churches to where we don't really feel like we're growing or thriving, and we might be able to learn something there that, you know, um, that we wouldn't normally have learned because we weren't geared towards that type of environment. But sometimes we're in, we're in different places, not because the people are bad or anything like that. We want to guard our heart against the spirit of offense. It might just not be the place that we were thriving in, and so we begin to look for the places that we thrive. Right? If I'm a fish, I want to hang out with other fish. Right? And so. What I'm doing here is kind of developing a framework that's going to take intelligence and then kind of look at it from a different angle. So then we can look at emotional intelligence and spiritual intelligence. So intelligence, as we traditionally have known it, is the ability to acquire, to acquire and apply knowledge and skills, right? And that sounds good. Um, I want to apply it as much as I can. I was listening to an A.W. Tozer book this week, and he said something along the lines of, wherever you're at, Whatever capacity that you have, learn as much as you can in that season, right? You know, I have some dreams of further education and things like that. And, you know, while I'm, we're pastoring down here in Florida and doing a couple of things, last summer I was actually able to finish my bachelor's in biblical counseling, not from Oxford University, right? But I was able to do an online course. So I was able to do what I could with the time that I had 
with the finances I had where I was at, right? So it's, it's one of those things where I wasn't waiting until, you know, finally the door opens for me to go to some type of prestigious place. And again, using this as an example, I just made the most out of the time I had in the place I was in life because when maybe the next door does open, I can say, hey, here's what I've done, here's where I'm at, and here's where I'm going, right? And so applying knowledge and skill intellectually is great, so I'm not gonna criticize that here, but often we stop there, especially in the Western world. Um, you know, there's also a, a, a balance between um, knowledge and experience, right? So the Western world thinks which one do they think with, right? We think with knowledge, right? And the Eastern world's more experiential. There's a, who, have you guys had Putty, Dr. Putty Putnam on? All right, he's, he's, a, he's a believer, and um, he actually has a PhD in uh, either quantum or astrophysics. So you could say his intelligence factor is pretty high. But he used to have a, uh, I think the school's still going, but it was called the School of Kingdom Ministry, and I actually have the manual from it. And in the beginning of it, he has an antidotical siliquism. Say that five times fast. And so he presents a question. Now, sometimes, like we're reading the Bible, right? We, we'll read it, and we'll be like, hey, this is what the Bible says. I just read that line word for word. I'm telling you, that's what it says. But we, what we don't realize is that we're reading it through the lens of a Western thinker, Right? And so he, he paints this picture kind of like this. He gives two facts, right? Fact number one, it's cold in England. Everybody got your facts? All right. Fact number two, cotton does not grow where it's cold. Are you guys ready? You got your intellectual facts ready? All right, I have a question. Does cotton grow in England? Well, how would most of you just naturally respond based on those two facts? Would it be a no, the cotton doesn't grow in England, right? That's not what the Eastern person would answer. They would say, I don't know. I've never been there. Because the information would not override the experience. Does that make sense, right? And so often in our world, we're thinking from an informative place rather than an experiential place. Now, like we kind of started the program unintentionally, one doesn't cancel out the other. The whole point is for them to work in unity, right? To make us healthy and to make us understand. You know, scholars say that the Bible isn't written to us, it's written for us, right? But the Bible's personal, it's the Word of God. Absolutely. But the first thing we need to understand is, is that it was written in a different time, in a different place, to a different people. So if we can grab hold of the literary, cultural, and historical context in the time in which it was written, ah, then we can exegete or we can extract what applies to us. Then it becomes personal. But it's become personal because we put ourselves in their position. Now we understand stand it how they did it. And now we can make hermeneutics or application to what it means for us today, right? I know that's basic Bible study. Um, if I had something like this, now, no mathematician. Are there any mathematicians on here? All right. Everybody see that? All right. So do I do this, this equation? Do I do it from left to right or do I do it differently? Where do you begin? I do it left to right. I do the 5 plus 3 is 8 and then I go to the 9... Minus 2 is 7, and so then you take it and multiply it. Nope. Nope. Yep. Good try, though. Good try. 3 times 7 is 21. 5 plus 21 is 26. So, yeah. So, you do what's in the parentheses first, and then you work out, right? So, it doesn't go left to right. You start with the principle that the parentheses are first. And so... And then work from there. And then work from there. And so sometimes we read the Bible like that. We're kind of like, we're reading it left to right, not realizing that in Hebraic culture, who at the time of Jesus spoke Aramaic, living in the Greek world, there could be some things going on there that we're not quite aware of, right? And so what we do, how do we, how do we understand all that? Well, we just dive in. You guys are in a school. You guys are like, hey, I want to know more about God. I want to know more about the Word. I want to know more about the Bible. So there's a different kind of way of looking at things that maybe we haven't considered. 
Uh, I got a great book recommendation for you somewhere. So a book that really helps kind of go through some of these things of how to read the... Um, it's funny because in our school, the first book we give them is How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. And then the second book we give out is How Not to Read the Bible. Right? So this kind of helps us make sense of some of the passages in Scripture that qu don't quite line up. So here's what's happening. The Bible's written experientially, but we're reading it intellectually. Right? And so some the different types of literature, the narrative, the prose, the poetry, right? All of that is written to invite us into an experience to see the point of view of the writer, the people he was speaking to, and what he thought about God, men, and everything that was happening there. And so that gives us a completely brand new grid of how to read the Bible. So what we're doing here is we're expanding. We're actually expanding our intellect. We're not limiting it, but we're expanding our intellect to see from a different position or uh, point of view. Right? So let's look at the three kind of things we're going to go over today. IQ is intellectual quotient, right? Quotient is a measure based on however they are, you know, doing the test, right? EQ is emotional quotient or emotional intelligence. And then SQ is spiritual um, quotient or spiritual intelligence, right? And you guys have seen Mama, Mama Pat's little triangle, right? Where she kind of goes like this. And she shows right there how IQ, EQ, and SQ all work together. They all go hand in hand. And not only do they work together, sometimes you can have EQ and she calls a, a spiritual quotient anointing quotient. She calls it AQ. AQ and EQ can work together. EQ and SQ can work together. And then uh, SQ and AQ can work together. I think I needed an I in there. But you get the point, right? I'm just I'm, I'm trying to piggyback off, off of her. So these things aren't independent. Two can be working or all three can be working or you can be in one. It depends on where you're at, what's happening in front of you at the moment, and what the Holy Spirit is doing through your life at any given second, right? So each one enhances the other. So in one sense, I'm going to talk to you in two different layers here. Are you guys tracking? Is everyone tracking? All right. I'm going to talk to you in uh, a couple of different layers here. There's a triunity between um, IQ, EQ, and SQ, right? So we're a triune being. Spirit, mind, and body, right? Or some will say spirit, soul, and body, and the soul is the mind, will, and the emotions, right? And then body. And so if we're, if, if we're in proper alignment, and I'll hit more on this later, then our spirit is reigning over our mind and our mind is reigning over our body. But we know what happens if we fall out of alignment. If all of a sudden my body is reigning, then I'm probably going to react in the flesh and do something, get some kind of gratification. If I have an empty love bucket somewhere in my heart, I'm probably going to try to run from pain and towards pleasure to fill that empty space in my life, right? You see that at, with St. Fotini. She's the woman at the well. She went with an empty bucket in her hand, but that was representative of the empty bucket in her heart. And she goes to the well, and what happens? There's a man sitting there. Give me something to drink, right? And so what is he doing? He's presenting himself as the answer. He's presenting himself as the well that fills every empty space in her heart and her life. You know, and here's another example of everything we're talking about. If you read how modern translators translate that passage in John 4, it really kind of feels like the woman at the well is the bad guy. She's in a mess. And Jesus is there to rescue her out of her mess, right? Have we all read it that way? Jesus is like, hey, go call your husband. Well, I have no husband. You're right. Katya. What if that's not what was happening there? Hmm. Well, if we kind of put ourselves in her shoes and her day and age and environment, we're going to realize a couple of things from the get-go. Women were not allowed to um, apply for a certificate of divorce. Only men could divorce. Right? So she have had, has had five men reject her and divorce her. And the one she was with now would refuse to even marry her. Ah. Oh, and so in Galilee in that, age, that day and age, did you know that the men would propose to the women at the well by offering them a drink of water? So here you have Fotini rejected her whole life by different men who would 
who would only make withdrawals from her but not make deposits. And then when they were done making withdrawals, they would dump her. She goes to make a withdrawal from the well, but then there's a man waiting there to propose to her, and he was only there to make a deposit. Does that make sense? Oh, wow, all of a sudden, the story in an experiential mindset is completely transformative. She drops her empty bucket because she no longer needed it because her thirst had been quenched. Come meet the man who told me everything I ever did. Come meet the man who filled every empty place in my heart and life. All of a sudden, the one everyone knew in town comes back into town and they hear her testimony and they're like, they immediately recognize the change. She's no longer looking for earthly things to fill the empty places in her heart. We recognize that there's evidence that she has been touched from a heavenly place and now she is full. You know, in that day and time, the, um, the well is outside of town, right? You had to go outside of the gate to get the water. What's happening here? The well flowing from Jesus through her is now going into town. Everyone hears her testimony. And then what do they do? They run out to have their own personal encounter with Jesus, right? And so you see this replication happening of someone, Jesus took the, the lowliest person in the city and raised them to the highest place and that she became a mouthpiece, mouthpiece that began to quench the thirst of everyone else in the city, right? And so even in St. Fotini, you see a misalignment happening, right? Her mind was looking to feed something in the body and her spirit felt detached. What's one of the questions that she had for Jesus? Hey, our people say we worship here, but your people say worship in Jerusalem. And he says, I'm telling you the truth. There will become a time when true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. It won't be locational, right? It's moving from geography to cosmology. It's moving from a place in the earth that was a shadow of things to come into the reality that wherever you're at, that's the temple. That's the presence. That's the place where, where heaven and earth connect, right? That's the place where I want to touch you in that moment. All right. And so there's a triunity here that the spirit's SQ, the mind's uh, IQ, and the body can be EQ. However, it can also be all three in each one. My spirit can operate in spiritual intelligence, emotional intelligence, and intellectual. My mind can operate that way, and the body can operate that way as well. All right? Um, so let's... let's Let's take a look at each one of these, and then we'll dive in more into EQ and SQ. Did you guys know there's nine types of intelligence? Let's see. I'll, I'll put this up there for you to take a quick look. Again, a quick Google search. We'll just kind of pop this out. And this really falls under the umbrella of IQ. So there's intrapersonal intelligence, understanding yourself and what you feel and what you want. Right? What's going on inside of me? A lot, of, a lot of us, you know, there's times when I'm not aware of what's going on inside of me. And I'll say yes to whatever comes. My boundaries will begin to drop because I'm trying to do what Fotini did. I'm trying to fill those empty spots. There's spatial, visualizing the world in 3D. There's naturalist, understanding living things and reading in nature. There's musical, discerning sounds, their pitch, tone, rhythm. Uh, there's logical and mathematical, qualifying things, making hypotheses, improving them. There's existential, right? It's tackling questions of why are we here? What's going on? What's happening out there? And you're seeing how some of these will tie into spiritual intelligence. Interpersonal, seeing people's feelings and motives. And then there's body or, you know, kinesiology is coordinating your mind and body, right? You'll see athletes who are intelligent there. I mean, where's Mozart intelligence? Music or climbing mountains, right? If he was judged for climbing mountains, I don't know. Maybe Mozart was a mount Mozart the mountaineer, right? And so the people that we, we esteem highly as prodigies or savants, you see them really figure out the vein that they're in, and then they just maximize that, right? Now, I have this, this problem to where I'm just interested in everything. <laughs> so I have a hard time narrowing in, ooh, like I'll paint today, or maybe I'll play my guitar. And so my painting and my guitar, they're not great. Neither one of them, right? You know, the thing I've probably applied the most in my life is the things of the word. But there's been times I've been intellectual. I was into karate. I was into sports. I was into skateboarding, into weightlifting, you know, into all of these different things. So it's like 
below average on each one of them, but, I, but there are a couple that are rising to the top. So you can have an interest, but that doesn't mean that you need to be a Mozart in that field. Just enjoy that hobby and enjoy sucking at it, all right? Enjoy that as an outlet of, hey, I don't know how to do all this, right? Like sometimes when I paint, I'll mix acrylic and oil and you artists are like, stop it, stop it right now, don't do that. You know, and all I gotta do is put some hairspray on it and it holds everything in place and it looks like a mess, but I'm happy I created something interesting and no one will ever see it again, right? But I'm not, I have no aspirations to become an amazing painter. Like I'll look at Akiyani or someone like that and enjoy what they're doing. And so I'm not gonna criticize myself for a place that I don't have intelligence, but I do have as a hobby, right? So what can we do? We can give ourselves a break and just enjoy doing something that you enjoy and you don't have to be a master at it. However, when I understand that and I can recognize it, where's that thing that I'm thinking about day and night? What's that thing that causes me to burn that I just can't stop thinking about, right? I might have excitement and fear mixed together in that, well, maybe I should, but what if I fail? Who cares? That one burning thing, those one or two things, that might be you know, how God designed you. And if you keep thinking about that and that thing makes you come alive, that might be the area of your calling or your vocation or what you're designed to do, right? And so what I'm doing here is saying, hey, when I read those different intelligences, we don't have to be good in every single checkpoint of that. We might have one or two that are great, but we might have other interests. Other interests are okay, but we can really begin to develop and identify. You know, when it comes to, to life coaching, like one of the, the questions that we ask is, you know, what causes your heart to burn? Where do you see yourself in five years? What was the step before that? What's the first step that you take to get there? Sometimes we don't know what to do because we can't really identify all of this stuff inside of us, right? But if we can apply some of these IQ, EQ, and SQ tools, it can bring clarity. Then we can ask ourselves, hey, where do I want to be in five years? Where do I want to be in 10 years? And once I get there in 10 years, oh, wait a minute, how did I get there? What step did I take, right? I personally, I don't know if I'll ever get to get a PhD. I kind of joke about it, but I do have that as a goal. So what can I do today? Well, if I can't take a course, I'm gonna listen to as much books as I can. I'm gonna study as much as I can. So when the time comes, I have a step ahead of the game. When I got my degree in biblical counseling last summer, I did it 120 hours in three and a half months, not because I'm some super, smart guy, I did it A, because it's online, B, because I can read fast, and C, because I watched all the videos on two times speed, <laughs> right? So I use some of these tools here, right? I'm, I'm helping myself, but I studied a field I had been studying for 20 years. And because I had been studying it for 20 years, none of the material was new. I was able to jump right in and kind of, okay, I know this, right? And so if it's something that you're wanting to advance in, but you don't quite yet have the time to, to, the, to get, a, get a degree, and it's not about whether or not you want a degree in it. It's about, am I growing every single day in this thing that causes my heart to burn? What am I doing to fuel the fire in that every single day, right? And so if I'm fueling that fire in that every single day, then when the time comes or the opportunity comes, hey, I'm ready to step into that degree or not, I've been spending my life, I've been giving my life to this thing, right? So the degree would go to the IQ side, right? But there's other, you know, veins that don't need a degree. What does it need? It might need bodily things. It might need uh, some of these other things that I mentioned in IQ. But we can look at some of these tools, even some of these tools that are secular, and we can extract the design of God out of it, see it from heaven's perspective. You know, if we're all created in the image of the creator, that means all of us are creators. And there's people out there and people throughout church history who've been creating and they've been created in the image of the design of God and they didn't even know it. But what if someone comes along and says, hey, I recognize the creativity of God in you, then you'll see their creativity go to the next level. All right, so check this out. So that's intelligence. Are you guys good? Are we good? That's great, yeah. And if you're, if you're unaware of it, just take some time before the Lord and write down what makes your heart burn. Uh, there's a good book out there called All It Takes is a Goal by John, um, I think it's Acuff or Acuff or something like that. So a lot of times when, we, when it looks at goal setting or identifying what our hearts are passionate about, sometimes we think towards the future, right? 
but he gave a different approach. Now thinking towards the future, it's great, but use that as a tool over here. But here's a different perspective he bought in it, he brought to it. What he said was, is do this, look at your past and look at those peaks. Five, 10 years ago, what was a peak in that year? What made me come alive in that year? Six years ago, what was a peak? What was something that caused me to come alive? Three years ago, what was a peak? What was something that caused me to come alive? So sometimes we can build our future by looking at the things in our past that were the, some of the best memory stones of our life. And we can take those memory stones as, as, out of the past and use them to create footpaths in the water to get to where we're going. So what caused you to burn before might be causing you to burn now and then you can throw those stones into your future and use them as steps to get to where you want to go. So good. So just piggybacking off, off of what you said, what causes me to burn now? Now sometimes when we, when we set goals, we begin to go in one direction, but then immediately, hey, wait a minute, I think I want to go in a new direction now. And that's okay because action brings inspiration and it causes us to think bigger than we were thinking last week. And if action plus inspiration equals a bigger dream, and that's okay to make an adjustment in that dream at that moment. All right? All right, so as we're processing these things, as we're growing, we're gonna jump into some understanding of emotional intelligence. Uh, here's a book that we use at our school. I think it's also the book that uh, Global Awakening uses as there, as I'll drop this on the screen. Um, you guys seen that book before, Developing Emotional Mature Leaders? So I'm going to give you Aubrey Moffress's uh, definition of emotional intelligence. Oh, it's right in front of me. All right. I define emotional intelligence as an awareness of our emotions and the emotions of others around us so that we can handle well our emotions and theirs, especially harmful ones with the result that we relate in a Christ-like manner with those within or outside the body of faith, right? So then he kind of adds to it with some of these subpoints right here. Emotional intelligence is a growing emotional self-awareness. It involves one's ability to increasingly recognize and monitor one's emotions. It's a growing awareness of others' emotions. We must become aware of and read not only our own emotions, but the emotions of others, the people we work and minister with, live with, and relate to on a regular basis. Thus, we become not only more self-aware, but more aware of others as well. How do the two relate? The one can build on the other. As you become more emotionally self-aware, you should become more emotionally aware or emotionally other aware. This growing awareness of others happens primarily as we listen to and observe people, right? And again, this ties into basic um, communication skills, but how many times does someone barely begin to get something out and then we react right away, right? They barely begin to speak and then we jump past them because, hey, we know what you mean. Don't you mean that? But don't you, uh, but don't you, right? So good listening skills, and the good listening skills can actually apply to listening to our own heart, and as we listen internally, we'll be better external listeners, right? So he gives six keys to emotional um, intelligence. One, emotionally mature Christians are spiritually mature believers. The popular term for this concept of emotional maturity is emotional intelligence, EI, also referred to as EQ, right? And he, he relates that to being mature. Two, the Godhead is characterized by emotions. Three, the hope of the world is the emotionally mature church. Four, emotional intelligence is critically important to God-honoring leadership. Five, scripture undergirds the importance of emotional maturity. And six, emotions are central to what it means to be human. You guys read this book? You want me to go through that list one more time? Okay, I'll go through these six keys one more time. One, emotionally mature Christians are spiritually mature believers. Two, the Godhead is characterized by emotions. Three, the hope of the world is an emotionally mature church.
Four, emotional intelligence is critically important to God honoring leadership. Five, scripture undergirds the importance of emotional maturity. And six, emotions are essential to what it means to be human and live life. So we're on the tail end of the age of logic and reason. God's moving supernaturally in the life of Jesus. God's doing awesome things in the Acts, the book of Acts, Acts of the Apostles. God's doing amazing things with the early church fathers and mothers, the Abbas and the, the Abbas and the Amas throughout the first 300 years of uh, church history. The more church gets institutionalized, part of that was good. But what happened? Part of the institutionalism was good because organization within a culture means that you guys can launch out into different areas and pr promote the gospel. What was bad is they started to leave behind to a measure some of the supernatural stuff and trade it for the institution. However, you still had God moving supernaturally all throughout church history. You had it at monasteries, at abbeys, and different places. You have the mystics, the word mysticism, that comes from Christianity. The occult borrowed it later. That's not where it came from. It's not a New Age term, right? And so you see God moving supernaturally all the way up, even to the Reformation. What happens in the Reformation? A lot of good stuff. Hey, let's get rid of some of this institutionalized stuff. Hey, you can't buy your way into heaven with indulgences, right? Some of that stuff needed to be addressed and some of it needed to go. However, some of the Protestants that came after that began to want to on purpose use language that didn't sound Catholic. So even though they still believed in miracles, they didn't want to call it miracles because Catholic called it mir Catholics called it miracles. They didn't want to use some of the same language and imagery. And as soon as they began to separate from the language, they began to separate from the experience. And then you had some amazing people who did contribute to church history rise up, like John Calvin, Martin Luther, right? And some of these men, however... They were, they were, what happened in the Reformation is, is it coincided with first the Renaissance, which brought glory to God. It was a rediscovery of Greek thought and thinking, and it was this amazing explosion that began to happen. And then it kind of bled over into humanism. The things that they were using to praise God, they now began to use to question God. And so as the rise of humanism came there, knowledge and intellect began to reign supreme, and then that filters over into the church. And as knowledge and intellect begin, become, begin to become more important than the experience of God in himself. Knowing information about God began to replace knowing God himself and experiencing God. Not everywhere, just in the think tank that kind of exploded out of the Renaissance, Age of Logic and Reason, Reformation. So then you had people like Calvin, and particularly one of his disciples named Abraham Kuyper, began to use Calvinism as a worldview to defend Christianity against the humanist. But they were doing it apologetically from logic and reason, not experientially by demonstrating power. Now, interestingly, coinciding this, you have the Great Awakenings. John Wesley, Charles, Charles Wesley, George Whitfield, right? Jonathan Edwards, the Second Great Awakenings. You had the Cane Ridge Revival. Um, you had... Uh, Charles Grandison Finney, right? You had Francis Asbury and the circuit riders. And so paralleling this, you did have experiential Christianity, but all of a sudden the Western world began to get governed by logic and reason. So that began to question experiential Christianity within the church, and it began to, su to suppress emotion. Right? People, I mean, if you read church history, it's crazy. Like, you know, there was one meeting, I'm about to shock you if you're not prepared for this. I'll let Maria and Kendra clean up the mess. But there's one me meeting, reportedly, where the glory of God came in so heavenly, 900 people levitated. Right? There's meetings where people would, you know, begin glowing like light bulbs. Uh, you know, the Great Awakenings, it said that there were scores slain in the spirit, and it looked like they, they were at a battlefield. Right? Um... You know, resurrections, people going into trances, people translocating, right? Hey, that's all in the book of Acts, by the way. Every single thing I just mentioned, right? And so you have this all throughout church history, but then, hey, wait a minute. I don't know if we need to experience God. We just need to read about Him, right? 
Interestingly, when Jesus came, the Pharisees literally had a box tied to their head with the word on it, like this. And Jesus himself is standing right in front of them. But they couldn't see who he really was because they were so devoted to this, they missed the world that this creates. Right? And so I said all of that to say there's value in emotions. You see God being emotional with the prophets. He's sharing his heart with them, right? Some of it sounds harsh, but it doesn't reveal the nature of God. What it does is it, it reveals reaction and response and how to manage it healthily. That book, How Not to Read the Bible, really goes into some of that. Right? And so we're emotional beings. We are created with emotions. We're created in the image of God. God's emotional. And that means that the reason we have emotions, emotions aren't from the devil, right? Emotions are from God because that's how we experience and enjoy life. Um, so one of the things he does in this book is he begins to walk us through emotions. Okay, So in the way the body's uh, physiologically made up, emotions are in the amygdala. Right? Everybody say amygdala. Right? And our intellect is in the frontal cortex. Right? Have you guys read... Uh, Switch on Your Brain by Carolyn Leaf. She talks a lot about neural pathways, neuroplasticity, and how all of these things begin to work. And so the emotional brain is also called the old brain, right? And that's responsible for f fight, flight, or freeze responses, right? Well, there are situations where I need to fight, flight, or, free or freeze in order to survive, right? And so those Everything goes through there and then into the frontal cortex because within the amygdala is a life-saving uh, matrix, right? This can save my life, right? Train coming. Should I stand in front of the train? Hmm. Right? No, no. Train coming. Move. Ah! Then I process. Man, that was close, right? I'm glad my body listened to my amygdala and didn't have to frontally cortex process that for 30 minutes, right? Um, you know, and so there is a use for that. However, it can, it can get to an unhealthy place, right? So one of the, some of the definitions he brought about in the book was, is all of a sudden I can become aware of my internal world. I can become aware of my emotions, right? So emotions aren't accidents. Emotions don't just happen. Every emotion first has a thought. I think something, train coming, ah, fear, flight, <laughs> right? I think something that causes an emotional, an emotion, right? Um, and then the emotion causes the feeling. Emotions aren't feelings, right? Um, let's look at his definition of an emotion. And we'll see the difference here. So again, a lot of that does go into like if a healthy mother and a healthy father know who they are and whose they are, and the gift sets that both mo uh, mother and father offer, then you'll see a, a really healthy dance there come into to how to raise a child with emotional health. Now, on the one hand, the father may be able to help a child suppress the emotion of fear and climb the tree. Uh -huh. Whereas mom may, might be going, hey, oh no, don't fall, right? So I think there's a healthy balance and a healthy tension there. However, if one begins to dominate and override, then that's where the suppression happens, right? And you see that, you know, happened in the church. Hey, don't be emotional. Uh, the greatest generation, they're known for saving the world from, you know, two world wars, but at the same time, they were very unemotional and they would suppress emotions. So what did the boomers do, right? The sexual uh, revolution in the 60s and 70s, right? Um, and so then you can kind of see how the different generations, what they focus on, is their strength, but what they suppress is what the next generation rebels with, and that becomes their main thing. And you see it go through the church, and you see it go through church history. I think if we had a better awareness of our emotional health, you would see less children being so attracted to LGBTQIA stuff, right? And they would know who they are, they would know whose they are, they would, you know, um, if they weren't protected by father or, or um, provided for by father, then, or if father was unsafe or abused his authority, then I feel safer here um, with, with women. However, I still have an emotional need to connect to a father, and so my appearance may change or something like that. Some of these things begin to happen because I'm still looking for the outlet of how I was created. 
And if I don't get that from the natural means, then I actually pervert that and end up recreating it in my own image and then projecting that back onto my parents. I project that back onto God and I ultimately project that back onto myself, right? So like you're saying, if we squish, squish the emotions, then when kids go up, grow up, they're gonna have a hard time processing it, right? On the flip side of it, if someone is overtly emotional, then they'll never pull themselves together and get tasks done or accomplished, right? So here's his definition. I define an emotion as a unique, unplanned urge to love, hate, or express some other feeling that happens subjectively, subconsciously, and physiologically, and is directed externally towards a person or thing. I define an emotion as a unique, unplanned urge to love, hate, or express some other feeling that happens subjectively, subconsciously, and physiologically, and is directed towards a person or thing. Now for him, the emotion always has an object and typically that object is external. Why are you doing this to me? Why did that guy cut me off in traffic? What's going on? You know, um, or it could be, oh, you know, like Pepe Le Pew and the old Looney Tunes. I love you so much. Hello, it's good to see you, right? I'm experiencing an emotion, you know? Um, what was it? Was it Elf? He didn't know how to process his emotions when he's talking to uh, Zoe is it Deschanel. He's like, oh, when I see you, uh, my tongue swells up in my throat and my hands get all tingly and uh, yeah, you know. So you're seeing his, his feelings, like his physiological responses to the emotion of, I love you, I love you so much, right? And so, um, so emotions are, are a response usually directed outward. Now I can, I, I, in my opinion, we can direct it back towards ourselves, right? But typically we direct it back towards ourselves either based on self-preservation or, or external acceptance, right? Um, here's another game-changing book. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Danny Silk's book, Unpunishable. Um, now it will challenge you at the beginning but if you, if you make your way through it, I think it'll be very beneficial. But what it does is it removes the idea that God is punisher, that he was ever a punisher, and he would ever punish you. And what he does is he goes through the Garden of Eden and he talks about how Adam and Eve were experiencing God versus the true image of how God was presenting himself, right? And then what does Jesus do? So the entire Old Testament, they're kind of looking through a glass darkly from a fallen state, the one who never fell but chose to descend, Jesus shows up as the exact image, the perfect representation of God, the unveiled one. And so what does he do? He restores the human condition to the right image of God. He fulfills everything in the old covenant and reveals the true nature of God within himself. And so Daniel goes through a lot of that stuff. And basically, if we're afraid of punishment, then we're going to do what we can to self-protect. And when we self-protect, we're firing from the amygdala, the fight, flight, or freeze response. Again, sometimes that's good, like I said before, but sometimes what does that do? It causes, causes us to um, um, create unhealthy attachments, connections, and relationships with those in our life based on our, our intellectual, spiritual, and emotional intelligence. Are we tracking? Are we doing all right? I know this is a lot of information. Everybody doing good? If you're doing good, just give me a little bit of the wave. All right. Awesome, awesome. It's good to see everyone's faces on here. Just clicking through real quick. All right. So emotions, you know, the amygdala is often called the heart, you know, and the frontal cortex is often called the head. And sometimes the head, you know, prevents the heart from feeling. Sometimes it's the other way around. I feel so much that I don't find myself making healthy decisions. You know, and um, the, the goal isn't to suppress emotions, but to embrace them in a healthy way. And if we're embracing emotions in a healthy way, 
then we have emotional intelligence. Then we're becoming emotionally mature, right? And so one of the things that we, we do is we, um, there's too much to say, but some of, the, some of our primary emotions are joy, love, hope, anger, sadness, fear. Joy, love, hope, anger, sadness, fear. Now, there's a lot of different studies. There's a lot of different books on emotional intelligence. And so then there can be like an outer layer of emotions, such as disgust, shame, distrust, disappointment, and more. So here's kind of how emotions can work if we're unaware of what's happening. One emotion can slide into another. I can be angry. Anger can turn into rage. If anger turns into rage, what kind of action might come out? Violence. I can be violent with my words or I can be violent with my actions. Right? And like someone just said in the comments, that sometimes that can happen in a matter of seconds. Yeah, it can be like a volcano. You know? One of the emotions I had growing up in my house was anger. So I was learned, how do you deal with things you don't like? I get really mad. I say cuss words. I don't hit people, but I hit things, right? Um, I'm going to be raw with you guys. I don't know what it was. I think it, maybe it was it before pregnancy or after pregnancy. Me and my lovely bride, Alicia, were having a lively discussion. We were on two different, you know, I was on Mars and she was on Venus or something like that. Like I have a cup of coffee here and you can't see it, but I have a metal table. So I said something like, you're not listening to what I'm saying. Kind of just hit the top of the table, you know. I was like adding some of that into it. And so what happens to the, the coffee in the cup? So this was our old house and my bookshelf was right here. All over, notebooks. This shelf was full of books behind me. It went all over everything, all of the books, everywhere. And I'm like... That wasn't an emotionally mature decision, <laughs> you know? And so what, what, what was the consequences of it? The coffee cup reflected the eruption of my heart and my unhealthy emotions, right? And again, it can happen in a matter of seconds. And so it can slide like that. What's another thing that it can do? It can compound or add, right? Anticipation plus joy can equal optimism. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm so happy about it. Oh, this is going to be amazing. Right? And sometimes that's amazing. Sometimes I've heard people say, man, that is the best movie I've ever seen. It was awesome. And then you go in there and your expectations are so high. You're like, you're waiting for the wow moment. Um, Alicia and I grew up in the 80s and 90s. And so when Napoleon Dynamite came out, it was set in the 80s and 90s. It was like the greatest thing we'd ever seen. They had their trapper keepers. They had their tater tots. It was really like nostalgic for us. And so we, we were like, this movie's hilarious. And so when her parents watched it, they sat there like this the whole time. Like have no idea what's happening because it, it was full of, you know, like... Um, what do you call the joke that unspoken jokes like hidden jokes and innuendos but their generation didn't have any of that because they didn't go to elementary school in the 80s right and so they had no idea what was happening there um, anyways back on track right so being aware of our emotional state involve and involves ourselves and others and so this is how emotional maturity and spiritual maturity are going to go hand in hand okay so if if I'm getting angry at something often, I can begin to recognize I have a pattern of anger here. Someone cuts me off in traffic. Now, if I'm in the car with the other person, they're probably jamming out to, you know, they're, they're, they're probably praising, right? I've had so many friends, well, I was just praising the Lord as I was speeding and not looking at the road. The cop's like, hey, that's great. <laughs> However, here's your ticket. But I was praising the Lord, it's okay, you know. Um, but the other person's probably late for work or listening to Cindy Lauper, or doing whatever it is that they're doing, they had no idea they cut you off probably 99% of the time. However, I'll take that personally. They intended to get in front of me and make me mad. Well, first of all, no one else can make you do anything. You choose to get mad at someone. 
So if I find myself choosing to get mad at or upset at someone, I'm actually making that decision myself. They're not doing it to me. It doesn't mean that what they're doing is right, but how I respond is up to me. It's not up to them, all right? So I'm beginning to recognize, hey, this area in my life might have a pattern that um, I'm now aware of. I have emotional awareness, and that's the first step. So if I have emotional awareness and begin to kind of understand, hey, I was angry, and then I got upset, and then I got depressed. Okay, wait a minute. I'm not struggling with depression here. I'm struggling with the idea that um, there's a part of me that my love's not getting, I, I don't have love here. And so because I don't have love here, I want to get angry about what's missing in my life. But then it begins to kind of cycle out here. Now, if you're dealing with depression, get help. That wasn't a good thing to kind of illustrate there. I should have said something else like having a bad day. So if that is something you're struggling with, absolutely talk to someone about that. Um, but, you, but so what I do is, is I, wait a minute, I had a, I had a reaction, right? I had a reaction. Maybe it was hitting the table. The coffee went out. So let me, let me retrace my steps here. Let me become aware of what happened. Okay. Oh, I got upset at my wife for some reason because I was trying to be heard, but I didn't feel like she was listening. And why didn't I feel like she was listening? Oh, because I was devaluing her input. I was actually doing the thing to her that I was feeling, you know, upset about myself because everyone wants to be seen, known, valued, and loved, right? And so by talking to my wife, I was actually expecting her to give me some type of love language response back to me. And when I didn't get my projected response, but she spoke freely, okay, I'm starting to retrace my steps here and realize that I had a thought that I'm not valuable enough for my wife to listen to me. Where does that come from? Did that come from her or is it a reflection of how I value myself? Oh, where does self-value come from? Okay, now I can import some spiritual IQ, some spiritual intelligence. I can actually import some sozo tools as well. Where did I learn the lie that I wasn't valuable? Oh, that goes back to the time I tried to show my father this amazing model I built and he was too busy to look at it and I felt unseen, unknown, and unloved. Jesus, what was the truth in that moment? Oh, Dave, I saw your model. I thought it was amazing. <laughs> oh, oh, wow, you thought it was amazing. Yeah, so what was happening? Oh, your father was busy and he didn't intentionally mean to not look at what you were presenting to him. He had something else on his mind. And if he knew that he would have hurt you in that moment, he would have absolutely have stopped. Oh, so now I can rewrite my history. I can see my that past moment that was so traumatic for me from the lens of heaven, I can renounce the lie that my father was disinterested in me, and I can replace the truth when my heavenly father thought it was amazing, and I can choose to forgive my father for unintentionally ignoring me in that moment. All right, so that's how I can incorporate a sozo tool in there. Another tool, and this comes from our spiritual father, Leif Hetland. You guys all know Leif Hetland, right? So he talks about spiritual alignment. I'm spiritually aligned according to the Genesis blueprint right? What is the Genesis blueprint? Amazing, awesome, God, full of power, light, wonder, love, glory, right? Oh, here's a side note. I want to say this. Side note, sorry. Um, I think you guys will like this. So before creation, what do you have? You have Father loving Son. Can you guys see that? Is it Father loving Son, Son loving Spirit, Spirit loving Father. So between each of them, that squiggly line is the frequency of love, right? And so that frequency of love between them happening for eons and eons and eons, all of a sudden, one day, he took one of those frequencies and said, you know what? I'm going to take this frequency and I'm going to uh, wait until the 21st century and then I'm going to create Janela just for her generation, right? Whoa! So he took part of that love within himself in that frequency and he waited and waited and said, now, right in the moment of creation, all the, the framework of creation needs her right at this moment, right at this right time to reveal my love, wonder, awe, and splendor in just the way that she can do it, right? So each one of us were a frequency of love that was vibrating back and forth between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? 
And if we start there, hey, I'm emotionally secure, that feels pretty good, right? And if that's the pattern in the model, then I can forgive even those who on purpose hurt me because they were, we understand that they didn't recognize the frequency from which they were created. We can understand it and forgive them. It doesn't excuse their behavior or re-earn trust, but we can understand it and move on. All right, and so you have this amazing father. He goes down into the earth just like a snow angel, right? When you get up from making a snow angel, what's left behind? The imprint or image, right? So God himself laid down in the dust of the earth and his image or imprint went into the earth. And then what does he do? He breathes that frequency. He, breathes, he exhales the substance of himself into the ground. And then that imprint or that image animates into life. And Adam's, God's exhale becomes Adam's inhale. <gasps> bah. <gasps> bah. Right? Wow. So how was Adam created? Eyes to eyes, nose to nose, and mouth to mouth with, with his creator. So what was the first face that Adam saw? It was the face of a loving father. What's the vo first voice that Adam heard? It was the voice of a loving father. What's the first thing that Adam felt? It was the love of the loving father. What's the first thing that Adam experienced? It was the presence of the father. And where was Adam created to live? In the pleasure. Because Eden means pleasure. Right? And so you have this Genesis blueprint, spiritual alignment of seeing his face, hearing his voice, feeling his love, experiencing his presence, and abiding in his pleasure. Seeing his face, hearing his voice, experience, or feeling his love, experiencing his presence, and abiding in his pleasure. And all of this is in uh, Leif's book, Call to Rain. You guys have that one. And so that, that, that's our spiritual alignment. And so if I take these emotional tools and then apply them on the spiritual plane, then I can check when my heart is aligned with my father, right? I might be seeing his face and uh, hearing his voice, but man, when that guy cut me off, I wasn't feeling his love. Okay, wait a minute. It wasn't his fault that I wasn't feeling love. Where in the day did I lose my peace and step outside of love? Oh, it was back there when you had that thought and that emotion and that feeling. Oh, wow. Okay. So, Lord, let me renounce the lie in that moment and embrace the truth. Just like getting a chiropractic adjustment, all of a sudden, all five are now realigned, and I'm sitting, as Leif would say, in chair one. I'm ruling and reigning in life, not allowing life to rule and reign over me. Right? And so, this is how we can see spirit, mind, and body alignment. If my spirit has awareness of what's happening around me, then my mind and my body will fall into alignment. All right? Um, are you guys tracking? We doing good? So spiritual maturity. So a great book out there. I've been talking about it the whole time. Spiritual Intelligence by Chris Vallotton. And he really goes through um, a lot of it. So the way he frames the book is from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Um, when Paul just goes through the introduction to the Corinthians, when I came to you, I came to you in weakness and fear, much trembling. I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So you see a dichotomy of wisdoms here, wisdom from the world and wisdom from the Spirit. Right? For the rulers of this age didn't know and the one they were crucifying, if they did, they wouldn't have crucified Him. The spiritual powers didn't have spiritual intelligence either because they had fallen out of seeing His face, hearing His voice, feeling His love. Right? And so it says, but we who are mature do have a spiritual wisdom, a, spirit, a, a, a wisdom not from this world, but wisdom from above. Oh, okay. That mirrors Jesus talking to Nicodemus about metanoia, about being born, not again in the earthly sense. It's not an earthly recreation. It's a heavenly transformation, right? Oh, so how am I born again? I'll open up the wings of my spirit and allow my mind to ascend and think differently about what it looks like for heaven and earth to become one. Um, so in the creation, you have a triunity of, um, of creations. You have creator and creation. One became two, so two could become one. You have the heavens and earth. One became two, so two could become one. 
And then you have Adam and Eve. One became two, so two could become one. And so this is the beauty of that frequency. It's love reproducing itself so it could come back into the unity within itself, right? That's why creator and creation are always drawn to each other. That's why men are always looking to the stars. That's why heaven and earth are always drawn to each other. And that's why men and women are always drawn to each other. That's how it was created. Perversion is to take the creation and cause it to be out of alignment. So a fallen expression emerges. But the happy message, the gospel, Evangelion, the good news, the happy message releases cosmos and chaos and causes everything to come back to the alignment and to the plan of God. So when we're aware of God's eternal plan, how much He loves us and what's happening with, with inside of us, that empowers us to be spiritually mature and to answer with the wisdom from heaven. It says later on in 1 Corinthians 2 that we combine spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. So we're always connected. We're receiving the transmission. We become the transmission. And then when we speak it, we reproduce the transmission. Right? So receive, like Leif would say, we become, and then we release. And then he finishes off 1 Corinthians 2 with the staggering fact that we have the mind of Christ. So what does that look like when it's worked out in our lives? Right? I think that can look like overt and covert revival. Going back to how we started, what is it that you're into? What is it that you burn for? And can you burn where you're at while you're growing towards maturity? Hey, if you're a barista, go to the coffee shop. You make your latte in the presence of the Lord. Whoa, Lord. Wow, when I, when I steam this cup, I think about being filled with the Spirit. And Lord, as I steam this milk, I know that the person who takes a sip of it, they're going to feel your love. They're going to feel your joy. They're going to feel your glory, God. So I'm not just making a cup of coffee because I'm bored and I can't wait until I get hired at my better job. I'm making the most of that moment. I'm making the most of that opportunity. And then I hand that person that, that latte that's a supernova glory bomb explosion just waiting for their sippy sip. And they might take a sip as soon as you hand it to them. Or they might take a sip in the car, but when they take that sip, whoa, that's a latte. Because you did it with excellence, and you did it with anointing, and you did it with love. Right? Excellence is intellectual, the anointing is spiritual, and the love is emotional. Now we can see how all three of these can work together to reveal the kingdom. It could be covert revival, signs, wonders, miracles. It could be sharing the gospel praying for the sick. Uh, it could be being a solutionary. Chris Volton in his book talks a lot about having creative ideas, words of knowledge, and words of wisdom um, in different areas of our lives. So this is how I want to close. Um, we doing good? All right. So real quick, I forgot to do this. I'm going to give you the five components of emotional intelligence. I know you guys are recording this, so you can go back and take a look-see. Right? So, self-awareness. Be aware of your emotions as they arise. Self-regulation. Manage your impulses. Soothe yourself and respond appropriately. Hey, um, emotions can reach a boiling point, right? So, oh, I realize I'm getting angry. I realize I'm having the sensations. My palms might be getting sweaty. Those are all indicators for me to take a chill pill, right? Calm it down, Dave, right? Bring it back. Okay. But before I would just blow up every time and people didn't, I didn't have any friends because I would destroy my relationships. But now, oh, wait a minute. Just, hey, I'm sorry. Do you mind? I just need to go step outside for a second. I'm good. No, you're good. You're fine. It, I just need to get some air because I'm recognizing that I'm, I'm not thinking healthily right now. I'll just be back in a second, right? Even if it's awkward, hey, you're demonstrating emotional maturity. Self-motivation. Delay gratification. Stay motivated and persistent in spite of set setbacks. We live in a day and age where gratification is immediate. we got to have it our way and we got to have it now, right? We want to serve the king of kings, not the burger king, right? Hey, it's okay. I can be patient here. Because delayed gratification yields a greater... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? Culmination. I can have these small little wins, 
But if I with if I withhold the fact that I have to have a win here and a win here and a win here, because when I just give yeses all the time, then I'm actually saying no to the bigger yes. But if I can say no to the smaller yeses, I'm actually empower the bigger bigger yes in my life. I can say no to vegging out on TV. I can say no to staying up late tonight. I can say no to this. I can learn instead of watching TV all night. I can learn a skill instead of jamming out to music in the car. Unless you're, you know, worshiping or having a chill moment, maybe I listen to an audiobook. Maybe I do something to advance my career or better my understanding of the Lord. Oh, by saying no here, I'm actually saying yes to the yet to the future that I'm I'm wanting to build for me and my family. Right? Empathy, understanding others' feelings, wants, and concerns. I'm not just about me. I can put myself in share, their shoes. I want to see it from their perspective. Then I can partner heaven with the solution that they need, just like Jesus partnered with Fotini at the well. And five is relational management. I can manage others' emotions, organization. It's not like you start telling what people to do. You're just aware of how they're reacting or responding. And then you can use connective language that allows them to see themselves and others the way that God sees them. That doesn't have to be covert. It can be overt. Hey, you know, oh, wow, that is so amazing. I'm so glad you brought me that idea. I really hope we find a place to land that idea. But if not, hey, hold on to that idea. And I think we can use it on a future project, right? So I'm looking for re ways to let my speech constantly be redemptive, right? And so one last thing I want to say about spiritual gifts is how, our spiritual intelligence is how spiritual intelligence can partner with the spiritual gifts, Okay. I know we're running out of time, and I've said a lot, but just hang out with me. Um, so this is from an upcoming book I'm writing called Equipping for Ministry. So there's several different uh, lists of spiritual gifts. Uh, 1, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12 actually has two sets of lists uh, right there in the, in the, ver in the chapter. Uh, so the first list is word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discernment, speaking in tongues, and interpretation. The second list of gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 is apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, healing, knowledge, leadership, tongues. Again, just you can go back, check these out. They're all right there. I can even email Maria some of these notes if you guys want some of them. Uh, Romans 12 gifts. Those are prophecy, service, teaching, exhortation, leadership, mercy. And then you have the Ephesians 4 ministry gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. All right, so there's a whole lot of gifts, and then you can actually align them and see how they all kind of correlate and overlap uh, if you lay the list out and put them all together. And so if you take Jesus, pure light, and then shine him through the prism of our lives, we have a multitude of colors and a multitude of gifts that come together to be a rainbow, right? Um, and so it's one body, many parts. I have in my car a panel in the back, and that panel in the back has a little bitty clip that holds it on. Now, everybody might say the tires are the more important part of the car or the steering wheel. Now, those are pretty important parts. However, the car is not firing at full capacity if the clip on the little panel in the back is broken and I'm hearing rattling all day long, right? I had this old 1985 Blazer when me and my friends would go skateboarding and the, I had to flip down glass in the back and it wouldn't attach, right? And so I'm, I'm driving and they're like, is there a bird in your car? Because it would chirp. It would just do, 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 like the whole time. It was so annoying. I was not maximized the fullness of the one body of that vehicle in my life. There was something that was out of alignment and it was annoying, right? So I can partner with the rest of the body of Christ and the thing called a mechanic and go get that thing fixed and it can fire at full capacity. Side note. And so you can see how some of these gifts can actually be divided into categories. Now, the original authors wouldn't have been thinking about categories, right? Paul wasn't thinking about categories of gifts. However, God does move generationally, and so he can speak to us who are more intellectually oriented and say, hey, we can look at how some of these gifts work together. They all work together, but some of them can work together in different categories, right? And Randy Clark and Craig Keener and other scholars talked about this. So what I want to focus on real quick to conclude is the revelatory gifts. Now, typically, when people talk about the revelatory gifts, they're talking about prophecy, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, and discernment. 
Um, so I'm going to read you just a quick synopsis of each and talk to you how they can be emotionally intelligent. And I know that you guys have heard this before, but let's look at it from the lens of, hey, these are revelatory gifts. They're adding to my spiritual intelligence. Prophecy, a word inspired by the Holy Spirit that may reveal things in the future or cause things in the future to happen. It's also a word spoken that reveals heaven on earth and connects the heart of God with the hearts of his sons and daughters. It builds up, encourages, and comforts. What is a word of knowledge? A revelation from God about a present situation. It could be something you didn't know or a reminder of something that you did. It can be knowledge that helps interpret a prophetic word or insight into where someone needs physical or emotional healing. Word of wisdom. Wisdom is knowledge applied or in action or experienced. Wisdom is strategy from heaven that gives solutions in the earth. It can help someone apply prophetic word to their life or circumstance. It, can, it is also the enablement to be able to tap into the blueprints of heaven and transform the earth according to God's intention and design. Lastly, discernment is revelation about the spiritual realm, whether something is from God, us, or the enemy. It is also aware of spiritual dynamics within a situation and can discern God's heart in the matter. The gift of healing is also a form of discernment as you become aware of what is affecting the atmosphere and environment. So gift of healing. Sometimes we go into a room, all of a sudden, oh, wait a minute. Something's off, bro. I'm not getting good vibes, right? Hey, I feel something different here. Lord, is this coming from me or from the environment? Well, did you have it before you came in here? No, I didn't. It's coming from the environment. Okay, God, is this coming from the people in the room or from the spiritual atmosphere? Oh, wow, I think it's coming from the atmosphere. Okay, Lord, uh, where's the origin of this source? Is this the spirit of wisdom informing me of something or is this the enemy accusing me of something? Well, how do I know the difference? Oh, does it sound like the Jesus that burns inside of me, the fire that's in my heart? Does it sound like the one in whom my soul loves? Is it bringing me peace or giving me chaos? Right? Okay, so is it coming from an angel or a demon? Right? Is it coming from something else? So what is the author of the atmospheric shift that I became aware of? Now, this can happen on two layers. I can recognize the shift within me. I can recognize the shift around me. So spiritual intelligence uses some of these emotionally mature tools that helps us in our relationships. We can take that and then view it as a dynamic to interact with the spirit realm. You guys tracking? And so this is how we can use some of our spiritual gifts to be aware of what's happening around us. I could be ministering to someone prophetically. I don't tell them all of this stuff. You know, I'm a fitness trainer. When I first got my certification in fitness, I was talking to people about how the acetylcholine causes a muscle contraction between the sarcomere and the two Z-lines and the actus and myosin heads and how they would contract and break apart to form better, bigger hypertrophic muscle fibers. Yeah, they were looking at me like, what are you talking about, bro? I just want to be fit and in shape or lose weight. So I didn't tell them all that stuff. Maybe every now and then I would mention some of it, right? But what I would do is talk to them in a way that would inspire them to reach their goals. Because this is a teaching setting, I'm telling you all of these things. But if I'm ministering to someone, then what I'm doing is all of this stuff is happening within me so that the words that I do say are the most effective and can bear the most fruit. I'm cultivating the nourishment within me so that water that I share from the well of life within me causes the most effect in them at that moment. But I don't always share with them the process of it unless it's someone I can walk along beside and say, here's how I done did that, right? So again, we're seeing how spiritual intelligence can use the spiritual gifts and in particularly the revelatory gifts to partner with where someone is at. And we can also use it to make us healthy, spirit, soul, and body. Abba, <laughs> you're so good. You're so awesome. Lord, I thank you for everything that you've shared today. I thank you for the divine download, the divine input. I know a lot of the things that were said. So Lord, may a spirit of remembrance 
uh, just happen, may, may our minds begin to be aware of and pick up, even things that we're forgetting now in the moment, Lord, can you cause them, at just as Scripture says at the right time, cause a spirit of remembrance to come back, just at the pivotal place that we're able to apply the most to each one of our lives, God, and bring about the most fruit and most impact. And Lord, I know each one of us took something different. We all took a different slice of pizza out of the teaching today, and that's okay. Lord, let the part that was the most emphasized for each one of the of, of us on the call today, may that be the part that we begin to ingest. May that be the part that we begin to pursue. But here's the amazing thing. The part that was important to one of us, God, will be in a different part that's important to the other. Then we can make an exchange. We can have a conversation. We can iron sharpens iron. We can build one and up, uh, build up each other and the Lord. So, Lord, just seal everything that happened today in your spirit in Jesus' name. Hey, it was awesome. I thank you guys. I know that was a lot, but I really feel like the Lord was on it. And I, I could see your heads nod, nodding as I was talking. I could see the interaction and the apprehension of what was happening. So, you know, whenever you're in front of an audience, you can feel where they're at. And I just felt like you guys were there. So we just kept going deeper and deeper and went for it. And so that was an honor to be able to kind of do that with you today. So thank you so much.